This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. A quick request. If you like this podcast, please go to iTunes and write a review. Writing a review at iTunes, and I hate begging for these damn reviews, but writing a review at iTunes increases the profile of this show. It makes it easier to go out and land the great guests. Now, I like to think there is a viral buzz about this show, and I don't have to do some of these marketing things, but I got to do it a little. Go to iTunes, write a quick review, do your duty. My guest today is Catherine Stott. Her new work is called Hypno Trading, a practical guide to using hypnosis and NLP to improve your trading performance. NLP would be Neuro Linguistic Programming. And for those of you that might recall, one of my most popular guests, Charles Faulkner, has long been a proponent of NLP. From a big picture standpoint, it's simple. Trading's a minefield. Psychological and emotional challenges, baggages, you name it, everyone faces it. Frankly, it's well beyond trading. Everyone knows that basically us human beings are basket cases. Catherine believes that hypnotherapy and neuro-linguistic programming can help traders defeat these challenges and become more profitable. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Catherine Stott. Catherine, as I dig into your work, I dig into your world. I'm unfamiliar with you. I'm unfamiliar with your work. To some extent, I've talked to other people about NLP. But today, I really want you to be very educational because I want you to walk me and my audience through many, many aspects of what you know, your expertise. But perhaps, perhaps the the starting point would be a starting point for you. Here you are, you're involved in things like hypnosis, uh, NLP, and, and we need to define these and unpack these. But give me an early starting point where the fascination for you for these topics started to unfold. When and where? How? Well, I was uh, working as a psychologist and I moved over into bid management within the company I was working for to get some more psychology work. At the same time, I was getting married. It was a bit stressful changing jobs and getting married at the same time. And one of my friends said to me that she'd been to see a hypnotherapist for depression. So perhaps I ought to go and see her for a bit of stress relief. So I thought, well, I'd always been intrigued by it. And so I went along as she was sat there hypnotizing me and uh, I was getting great results from it I thought well actually this is the sort of thing I could do when I trained in psychology I wanted to be working with people Uh, I didn't want to be necessarily working behind a computer screen all the time so I uh, retrained and that was it that's where it started for me hypnosis and NLP and I want to break apart some of the differences and and define things but I think when most people hear the phrase hypnosis Perhaps they think back to things they might have heard in the 70s and 80s. Uh, perhaps they've got a wrong view. Perhaps they have no view. I, I, I'm, I'm fresh. I'm a beginner. But, but what percentage of people out there have actually had a chance to experience hypnosis? Feel free to start to define it for the audience as well. Well, hypnosis is very simply relaxation, being very deeply relaxed, allowing the conscious part of your mind that's always thinking about what you're doing and what you need to do and where you're going to be to go quiet for a bit so that you can focus on what you'd like to change, for example, or or relaxing and resting. And it's actually very similar in MRI scans to what happens to our brain when we're in a sleep state. So we're activating similar parts of the brain with hypnosis, but it is purely relaxation. So a lot of people assume it's going to be an altered state of consciousness in terms of 
being completely out of control and that's simply not the case at all you're always in control of what you're doing you know what's happening during the sessions some people forget but that's more likely because they choose to forget but they can create wonderful changes within within this wonderfully relaxed state whereas um, NLP is more about changing how you think using language and various different visualization tools to manipulate your thought processes when I think about how you just described hypnosis as somebody that practices yoga, I'm always looking for a state of mind that typically doesn't happen till the end of the practice to where I can somewhat be clear thinking. But this is, this is different. This, the, the yoga would be, would be more in the meditation space where hypnosis, you're getting people to a point where you're emptying the mind, but then you are reinserting new thoughts and new directions where you would like to go? Yes, um, essentially. I mean, the when you're very relaxed at the end of a yoga session and when you do the meditation, it's, it's a very similar state. So meditation, hypnosis, uh, mindfulness, they're all along a similar train of thought, but they just have, have different names. But once you're in a state of hypnosis, yes, you can readily accept things that you want to change the statements or um, affirmations or things that you want to happen but you can't be made to do anything you don't want to do which is why uh, if you were a smoker for example and you didn't really want to stop smoking but thought you should then going to see a hypnotherapist probably wouldn't work you actually have to want to stop what you're doing or make changes if you deep down don't want to then uh, those issues need to be addressed well, as I just mentioned, I seriously doubt many people in the audience have had a chance to experience hypnosis. Maybe I'm completely wrong. But for you, describe that first experience or even later on experiences. Give people a walkthrough on the process of hypnosis. We're going to take this apart in, in the context of trading. But I think if we just jump right into trading, people won't have a good foundation. So I thought it'd be a good place to start and just let you maybe walk through the experience, your experience, what you were feeling and, and what it did to you some of these first times that you experienced it. Well, the, the first time I experienced hypnosis, I was quite nervous. Um, I didn't really know what to expect. I knew that, you know, obviously I'd mentioned my friend who'd, who'd had it and she said it was just very relaxing. But, but naturally, you're going to be a bit nervous about it. And I just found it incredibly relaxing. I, you know, just relaxing different parts of my body, just allowing my mind to go quiet. I'm the sort of person I think about lots of different things at the same time because I'm quite creative and I have a lot of ideas. So to actually get the opportunity for my mind to go quiet for a bit is quite nice uh, and quite a treat and I remember thinking at the end of the first session I can't believe that just happened that was so amazing why have I never done this before and this was this was with a therapist yes this was with a therapist I had a few sessions and it was really good I made some positive changes allowed my mind to clear so I could make some good decisions about the things that were going on in my life at the time uh, and you know when I work with clients they often come away after the first session, completely amazed at how nice they felt and how pleasant they felt. I get a lot of clients who get tingly arms and feet, but some people feel heavy, some people feel light, some people feel hot or cold. Some people feel like they've got their eyes closed and nothing's happening at all, but that's just how they experience it for them. So there's no one hypnotic feeling. I can't attempt to ask you to walk through a session with, with a general audience out there. That's not going to that's not going to work. But I would love for you to perhaps even give a little bit of a flavor for for how the experience unfolds. Because I again, I'm flying blind here. I haven't done it. So, and I'm imagining many of my audience have not. So, I think if we can kind of if you can give people a little more walk through, a little more color as to how it unfolds, then we start to talk about it in the context of trading. I think people are going to go, aha. The first thing that I would do is talk to a client about getting themselves comfortable making sure they've gone to the loo this sort of thing switching their phones off and then I just ask them to relax each part of their body closing their eyes I often use color getting them to think of a nice color they find relaxing um, and then once I've got them to relax their bodies we start relaxing their minds so you create a safe environment for someone to go in within their mind so it could be a room or a beach or where, somewhere they feel safe and you get them to mentally go into that room and then once they're in a nice deeply relaxed state that's when you start the work with them it could be uh, simply lying there and listening to me talking saying all these positive things about what a fantastic trader you are and what brilliant decisions you make or it could be a more practical activity where I'm asking them to imagine or visualize certain elements of a trade or whatever it is they've come to see me for and, and see them doing it well or if, you know, for example public speaking if they're normally full of jitters then I ask them to see themselves delivering it calmly and confidently like somebody they would like to be like 
Uh, and then once the session's ended, so it can be anything from maybe 15 minutes to a couple of hours, depending on, on what they've come for, uh, I then bring them out of the relaxed state. Are you in a seated position? I mean, the the client, me, the end user, would I be in a seated position or, or laying on my back? How would that... It depends on the individual, but you can be sat up, you can be laying down. I mean, I've worked with clients who didn't want to recline because they just didn't feel comfortable or had medical problems so they couldn't, um, and other people prefer to be reclined because obviously when you're laid down, you automatically tend to relax a bit more. When I work with people via Skype, they most often are seated. Go ahead, for those out there unfamiliar, perhaps even the skeptic, talk about some of the history of hypnosis and feel free to go back in time as much as you would like. Well, I guess the first evidence comes from the Egyptians. Uh, there's plenty of evidence of them grouping together for trance-like states for healing processes. Uh, and then you've got more famous names like uh, Mesmer and how he used to work with people on mesmerism, hypnosis, and getting them to relax. And it gradually moved into a more scientific domain. The more modern day, moving into the NHS, the scientists that use that and the uh, well, scientist doctors, so in uh, Manchester, I think, uh, works with IBS quite a lot, and he came up with a, a fantastic protocol that's now used among amongst uh, many NHS hospitals. Uh, also, hypnobirthing's now being used in many hospitals because they're seeing the money-saving value in women not using the pain relief. And it's, yeah, it's just grown. It's more and more people are training in it. It's becoming more well-known. Um, it's fantastic. How did you begin to connect? And as I mentioned, I've had some guests on my show talking about NLP, but perhaps you can talk about there's there's several aspects of mind, mind work that you discuss in your newest work, uh, hypnosis, uh, the, the NLP, the neuro linguistic programming and havening. Why don't you go ahead and also talk about the, the NLP and the havening and perhaps even connect the dots on how these these different mind uh, technique, I guess would be the word, have come to exist in your world. And then we're going to start to connect that to trading. OK, well, when I trained as a clinical hypnotherapist, part of that involved NLP. Neurolinguistic programming is heavily used independently of hypnosis. But when you combine the two, it's very powerful. So you can help someone change their thought processes at a deeper level. So rather than maybe six months worth of therapy with a cognitive behavioral therapist you might have only weeks of therapy with a hypnotherapist who's using nlp as well havening is something i'm actually reasonably new to it's a psychosensory technique which is actually to do with the power of touch the idea is when you're experiencing stress or trauma whatever that might be you your brain releases negative hormones uh, stress hormones into the bloodstream when you haven which is essentially stroking certain parts of your body so your arms or your hands or your face that releases serotonin which is the body's feel-good hormone which inhibits the stress uh, hormones and therefore helps to relieve the stress that you might feel when re-experiencing an event or thinking about something so for example if you incurred a loss on a trade and it was causing you a lot of stress or you were holding it with you six weeks later still thinking about that time or even 10 years later still thinking about that time and it was still upsetting you then you can use havening to dull down the emotional reaction that you're experiencing give the audience an example a walk through with nlp Okay, so a really good example would be some, a technique that you could use for pain management or a negative feeling. So if, for example, you had a pain in your knee or in your stomach, then I might ask that person to associate a colour with that pain. And then if that pain were an object, what might it be? And would it be heavy or light? Would it be firm or soft? Lots of descriptive ways to, to view this object. So they get a real impression in their mind of exactly what that pain would be like if it was an object. And then I get them to start changing that. So uh, if they pick the colour red, for example, I'd say pick another colour that feels nicer, that would be less painful and then change the shape. So if they've gone for something quite pointy and sharp, um, perhaps make it a softer shape or make it smoother and then gradually shrinking it down and being able to imagine removing it from their body. And normally that is enough to distract them away from the pain and numb the pain or take away that negative feeling. So, for example, a lot of traders get anxiety. And when we've got anxiety, some people feel it in their chests or their stomachs or their heads. And you can get them to focus on that feeling and, and manipulate it and take it away. And that's quite quick. 
there is all different levels of hypnosis. There's a light, there's a deep, there's, uh, there is a spectrum. There's a spectrum of different experiences that people are going to have. Have you seen a situation yet, though, where, I mean, depending on where, I mean, look, people are going to have different levels of, of where they are in terms of their mind. But this is beneficial for everyone, regardless of what level they're on. Let's say somebody is the complete, you get somebody who's a complete skeptic. But as you've just mentioned, if you are, if you are of the mindset that this can't help you, it's not going to help you. But let's say somebody's a little, you know, they're a little skeptical, but they're open. It, have you found a situation yet where the benefit is, it, people still get surprised at the benefit, don't they? They do. And it's not uncommon for me to work with uh, people and them to come back and say, oh, I've had all this amazing changes, but I don't know if it was the hypnosis. <laughs> and they don't know what else it could be, but they're almost a bit skeptical or hesitant to accept that maybe it did change things for them, but they're happy to take the change. But I often find people are, are, are pleasantly surprised. And, you know, when you get someone who's hesitant or mildly sceptical when they come along to see you, you know, they might not relax that much the first time because it's new to them. But the second session or the third session, they'll relax more and more. As the sessions build, they get more benefit from it. So someone might only need a couple of sessions and someone else might need, you know, five or six. It really depends on the individual. Now, of course, we're only touching on some of these topics. Everyone is going to be forced to go dig a little deeper and dig into your work. Let's bring this into trading, though, which is heavily male-dominated. And as a guy in my 40s, I did not start yoga till three years ago, so I have no experience with hypnosis. But I have experience with having to uh, let go and to, uh, and, and to relax more than perhaps I'm used to relaxing. And I'm probably not too different than many males. And there is a certain... Machismo, uh, you know, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to relax. Talk about the conflict that maybe you have sometimes in dealing with males, because this is uh, when you when we in, and I want to also break apart here in a moment how you came into the trading aspect of it. But talk about dealing with males and uh, some of these subject areas. When anyone comes to see me it's normally because they know there's some sort of problem or difficulty they're having, and sometimes men can be very unwilling to admit it's a problem so they know they want to change something but they don't know how much they want to let go uh, and actually make those changes enough to admit to somebody a lot of the time it's about building up the rapport for traders in particular because it's such a, a specialist area you have to be quite knowledgeable they often think or assume that I won't know what they're talking about. Um, and then as they realize I do know what they're talking about and I can understand, have a full conversation with them about it, that gains their trust more and uh, they're, they're a lot more receptive to it and they get what they wanted out of the session. Whereas women tend to be a little bit more, I use the word emotional, emotionally open, but they'll come to you and they'll openly say, I've got a problem and I need help. Whereas men are a bit like, I'm here because I want to change something. But as you build up that rapport and they realize that I do know what I'm talking about and um, I get very good results, then, then it's easy. Not that it's surprising. Uh, I can think of one of the most successful hedge fund managers in the world, Lady Trader. She's uh, incredibly successful. But how did you walk into this world of trading? Here you have this uh, psychology background. You're, you're into hypnosis. You're into NLP. How did you connect the dots into trading? Uh, well, I was working as a hypnotherapist. I had a phone call from a trader and he said, can you help me with the stress that I'm experiencing? Do you know much about trading? And I said, well, to be honest, I don't know about much about trading, but I do understand a lot about gambling. Um, I've worked with people with gambling issues. And although it's not the same, there are many parallels. So I said, come along and we'll have a chat about it and we'll see where we go from there. And he was wonderful. He um, lent me some books and talked me through what he was talking about so that I could understand the problems more. We worked together and he got some really good results, some really good feedback from him. And so I went on to re research it a bit more because it ignited my interest. Um, I read a few more books, wrote a blog article, got a few more traders calling me up and gradually it grew from there. But hypno trading itself only started in 2014 when I decided that actually I wanted to take hypnosis and NLP more into the trading domain for more traders, whether they're home-based nov uh, novice traders or whether they're more experienced and have been doing it for years and work in banks or Wall Street, wherever. It's tough because each situation is different, so we have to generalize a little bit on a, a show like this. So let's talk about some examples in trading and perhaps how you 
help people to see from a, a different vantage, for, for lack of a technical term. Let's say, for example, somebody is, they just can't accept the loss. They want to hold on. They, they, they just know it's going to come back. They, they don't seem to understand the idea of a sunk cost, and they can't let go. How does hypnosis combined with NLP, how have you seen results start to unfold with traders in that type of situation? Well, quite often you've got to dig a little bit deeper and understand what it is that's causing them to not be able to accept that. So it's often less about the money or more about their belief systems, whether they believe that they're too good to, to lose money or whether that then dents their self-esteem if they when they do make a loss and they don't want to accept that, whether they've got a fear of failure, um, anything like that you need to understand and then get them to reprocess the information. So sometimes I use something that's called hypnoanalysis, which is regression. So the idea is our beliefs and values of today stem from everything that's happened in our past, whether that's from our childhood, our teen years or adulthood. You can go back and find those issues and get them to resolve them that they may or may not be aware of so that actually they can go on to uh, make those changes they want to and process the information better and accept that actually when you trade whether you like it or not you will incur losses and as long as your profit is greater than your loss you're doing all right talk about the difference between stress and anxiety and why don't you define those from your vantage well they're very strongly interlinked but stress is more to do with pressure and what's going on in your environment I suppose what's actually happening when you're trading so you're stressed about the fact that you might lose money the anxiety is the feeling that comes because of either the anticipation or what's um, or the, the result of what's happened so you can differentiate them but quite often they go hand in hand so somebody uh, might be quite stressed but they don't they're not actually anxious about it they they just need some help being of a calmer mindset when they go into trading. Other people suffer with anxiety. And it can be a little bit like the anticipation of a trade. Uh, you wake up in the morning and think, oh, you know, I'm going to go and check my charts or whatever. But before you even got to the point of opening your laptop, they're already riddled with the anxiety, the, the pit of the stomach feeling, or the getting sweaty, whatever it is. And so you can work on both of those. So you can calm down them both using different techniques but then the same techniques can apply to both i've seen you use the phrase throughout your work though and i i can guess some of the meaning but negative self-talk would that be more of an anxiety type moment not necessarily i think we've all got it within us sometimes if you do something badly that little voice in your head might go oh you're so stupid or i knew you were going to do that or why does it always go against me so just because you've got negative self-talk doesn't mean you're suffering with anxiety as I dig a little bit deeper on negative self-talk, I'm trying to put myself in that situation to understand when I might be doing it or not doing it. Can you give an example, something to illustrate to the audience of negative self-talk? For example, when you get dressed in the morning, you might get have a look in the mirror, be having a shave or doing your hair or whatever. You either look at yourself and go, yeah, I look good today. Or you go, oh, I just look tired and old or whatever you might think. And that tends to be a negative self-talk. We don't often realise we're doing it because it beca because it's such a common part of certain people's lives. Obviously, if it's to do with trading and you become to the point where you're expecting to lose because you always lose and you're, you, know, you, don't, you never get bigger profits, then you start to expect that's going to happen and you start behaving in a way that's going to do that. So I worked with a client recently who uh, would always make a profit, not always, but would make profits on a consistent basis, but only ever a small profit and couldn't seem to hang on in the trade long enough to reap the greater rewards. But that was because they'd got themselves into this negative self-talk cycle of, well, I'm never going to make the big money. I'm never going to achieve it. So as soon as they got to sort of four or five pips, they would exit the trade and that would be it and then they'd, they'd watch it go to 100 pips or whatever and think well why didn't i stay in there well i'm not good enough and there the cycle repeats so it's about breaking that cycle and getting them to see that actually they do have the potential to do it and they can get past that barrier they just need to work at it a little bit i can see the obvious benefits to where you're going with your work and i'm sure many of my audience can i wonder though about the issue of trading style there are some styles out there, uh, many of them very popular in the, the mass media, and a lot of people probably come to believe that some of these styles of trading are, are useful or they can win with them. 
Does that become a struggle for you in your work sometimes when here you are, you know, there's a universal application, I think, for, for many of the precepts and, and understandings and the directions that you're going, but if, if those get applied to uh, an individual that has a style of trading that perhaps is not grounded in, I mean, you know, the, the guy that's uh, sitting in front of the computer and trying to day trade on, you know, the uh, time frame of seconds, uh, th- th- this can be very difficult to help them, can it? Well, part of the process, the, the coaching side of it, is to get them to look at what they're doing and why they're doing it and whether it's the right thing for them. For example, uh, I had a, I run a workshop on Sunday, um, Trading is for Girls where I worked with a load of female traders and one of the elements that came out there is one of the traders liked to trade a system that was very precise so she knew exactly when she was going in and knew exactly when she was coming out. This style would suit the person who was actually sat next to her but she went with a more chaotic approach of I don't know which method to use so I'm just going to use six different ones and panic all the time but she wanted to know exactly when she should enter and exactly when she should exit. It was about actually making her realise there are many methods out there and you can find the right one that suits your personality. If you can't process loads of information coming at you from different sources, then trying to trade three different things at once is not going to work for you. Whereas if you're, I guess, more nomadic and you like to be able to make decisions in your own time, having something so precise is not right for you because you don't like being told so much what to do. So that's part of the work is working out what, what trading system they're they're using? Um, one of the first traders I worked with actually, he um, his issue was that he had a trading system that he talked to other people. It worked for other people, but not for him. We had to look at why that was, and it just didn't suit his personality anymore and his goals. So he needed to go out and start learning more. As a trader and as someone with years of experience, you'll understand that you can never stop learning, and you can have systems that work really really well, but it's still pays to look at what other very experienced traders are doing, um, understanding the different techniques that are out there, and as things move on in modern society, it changes. Without giving any names away, that's not my question, but I would love for you to open that up a little bit more. So you have a trader, uh, obviously some success, and successful at showing others uh, how something works, but what did you find out about as you got deeper for, for why he did not want to go that direction himself. We, um, a lot of the work that we did uh, came to him having a poor self-image and also a fear of success. So he'd, you know, done okay in life, but generally been reasonably mediocre, never, never failing, but never quite achieving it. And it came down to the fact that he, you know, he'd always been told when he was younger, you'll, you'll, you'll never, ma- you'll never be rich. You'll never make loads of money. That's, the mindset that he went in with and he wasn't aware at a conscious level that that's what was holding him back fear of success tear that one up a little bit i'm just when you have someone that you're working with and there's a fear of success i i like to think i like to think that i i don't have that but i i'm i'm guessing that most of us have it in some degree or another absolutely um it's very very common although a lot of people don't realize that's what the problem is quite often it can be things such as if you weren't particularly academic at school and always being told that you'd never you know you'll never be a doctor or um, everyone in our family goes into the construction industry or something then although obviously that can be very affluent as well you can get within you the 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 belief system that actually you don't deserve it and I was actually speaking to a trader the other day it came out that they actually felt that earning money through trading would make them feel guilty for having money because they didn't really feel like it was actually working for money. Not the same as if you went out and worked in an office all week for your, for your wage. Uh, and we had to do a lot of work around, well, clearly when you trade, it is hard work. You've got a lot of learning to do. It takes a lot of focus and attention. Um, it takes a lot of good skills. Um, you have to train in it. It's not something that many people find comes incredibly naturally to them. And actually, when you make profit from it, you deserve that profit. When you have someone that is perhaps questioning whether they have the... Uh the, the merit or they have the uh, they have what it takes to be successful I look at my situation I think I was very lucky to meet so many different types of traders with success and their backgrounds were so varied that I decided early on that trying to fixate on the background 
uh, you know, whether it's the particular degree or the particular college, I was like, this is all pointless because <laughs> there's so much variation that to latch on to one particular item as the quote secret to the success was was kind of silly in my own mind. And in fact, I, I had a conversation with a friend yesterday. He's got a very successful podcast, and he said to me, he said, you know, I, the one thing that really bothers me is that I don't have the PhD super successful podcast where all of these PhDs around the world from academia come on. And if you listen to him, he's just a brilliant guy, but he's still sitting there saying, but I don't have the PhD. And I'm thinking, who who cares? A lot of people feel like that, but sometimes it's about your experience um, rather than your academic ability and your thrive and drive for learning and, and achieving. Um, one of the questions I quite often get asked is, do you trade yourself? And I say, well, no, I don't. And the reason I don't and I haven't tried it is because I want to ma- maintain being independent in my thought processes and in my opinions when I'm working with, with traders. I know that the skills and the experience And the qualifications that I've got as a therapist and working with traders far outweighs the difference um, it would make to anyone whether I traded or not. And in fact, I think that if there were traders out there who were also therapists who specialized in working with other traders, there'd be a massive conflict of interest. Because if you trade one method and someone comes in with another then what's to stop you from telling them they're doing the wrong thing? I'm not there to tell them which broker to use. I'm not there to tell them which system to use. I'm there to help them overcome the problems that they've got. And I don't think I'd be able to maintain independence. And, you know, your friend, he's obviously very good at what he does. He's got a very popular podcast. A PhD, is that going to make it any more popular? Probably not. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I was thinking when I when he was telling me the story. But it was uh, he did not, in the moment that he's saying he wants that, you know, he feels he's lacking the PhD, he doesn't realize that the third party, me, is looking at theirs, looking at him and saying, uh, I don't see why that's important. Let's get, slide into a slightly tangential aspect of, of where your work goes, modeling. And one of the things, and I, I would love for you to describe how you view modeling, one of the things that I've seen uh, historically in trading is there have been very key mentors in the history of public trading, very successful men who who took traders under their wings, uh, so to speak, under his wings, so to speak. I can think of a guy named Richard Dennis, a guy named Julian Robertson. They each had this uh, progeny of, uh, of traders that became super successful. There is something about this modeling and, and believing in and learning from uh, someone that has, has gone down the path. Why don't you talk about modeling from your perspective and even comment on what I just said? Well, modeling is a, a is essentially a process of looking at what other people do who are doing something really well that you want to be doing really well and looking at their behaviors, their attitudes, uh, their actions, their beliefs, seeing how you can adapt what you do to essentially mimic that. Uh, you know, I think if you are very successful and very good at what you do and you have the time, the ability and the knowledge to teach other people and they're receptive to it, then they will in turn go on to copy you and in theory should also do very, very well. And one of the elements of of the book is is about modelling and saying to people who perhaps aren't doing as well as they would like, one of the ways that you can change what you're doing is to look at what other people are doing and work at copying that so it can be something really simple such as uh, if you if you wanted to speak well in public and it's nothing to do with trading but if you wanted to speak well in public but you find yourself just standing on the spot if you watch other people when they talk who are very good speakers they might move around they might tell jokes they seem very relaxed they might wear certain clothes and actually if you try copying that a little bit like role play then you in turn become a bit more relaxed because you can see yourself being that way. And it's the same with trading. If you have a role model out there, very good traders, and you look at what they do, you read their books, you perhaps get the opportunity to talk to them if you can, then you can start adapting your behaviours and that helps working towards your mindset. I'm a very great believer of instead of focusing on what you don't want, you need to start looking at what you want to achieve. Because most of us are so busy going, actually, I don't want to lose any money, that they're not focusing on the fact that they want to make a very good profit. Modeling can help them refocus in that way. It's just fascinating. It's fascinating to look at the concept of modeling and trading. And I, in my mind, there's, there's two ways you can go. You can have, if uh, e- either by your own effort of finding that mentor 
or you had the good fortune to find uh, that person to model that where you have that close personal experience, that's probably the best direction. But I think for the for the vast majority of people, they might not have a chance to get next to the superstar trader or even the star trader to model. But, and I'm curious your perspective here, everybody has the opportunity to get close to the right way of thinking uh, through the written word or uh, videos on YouTube. I mean, you can find those people, even if you can't touch them in person, you can find those insights. So I think the question becomes, and I see this in my world, I think sometimes people are really hesitant Unless they have had that firsthand experience, I touched the humanity of that person, they sometimes don't want to believe the written word. They they don't want to believe something unless they have they have been there to see it in the flesh. Do you have you seen that experience? Um, I'm going to use a TV program as an example. In the UK, they've got um, the program The Apprentice. I think they've got it in America as well. There's there's a guy there's a guy on that show who's pretty famous in America. This guy that the UK wants to ban yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> well, not, not what we're names. Um, but yes, the, on, on, the, on the UK version of The Apprentice, the um, winner this year was um, a plumber, and he'd actually read uh, back-to-back Lord Sugar's books. When he was going through the interview process, when he was going through all the different applications, or the, each week by week, you could see, and he would talk about what he was at the knowledge he was applying from what he'd read in Sir Alan's books. Uh, when on the very final interview, one of the things that Lord Sugar said was the fact that he could see that he tried to adopt his principles over the other candidate who wasn't necessarily learning as well as um, the, the the plumber, and so he won. And I think that's a wonderful example of you know he he took this knowledge that was in this book and he tried to apply it to his own business and how he ran his own life to become successful at what he was doing, and that in turn helped him later on when he decided to enter. The, the process of the apprentice and there are lots of books out there written by lots of great people and you've just got to find the one that suits you you know there's loads of trading mentors out there when you sort of google it there's you know dozens of them and it's like, well, how do you choose who's right for you and you've got to work out who you gel with who you think actually it reflects your values and what it is that you want to achieve and then pick them from that and hypnosis hypnosis could actually help somebody who's at the point where they're they're doubting the written word that they're reading. They, 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 for whatever reason, they, they don't want to believe it for, for whatever, uh, going back in time in their life that there's, there's a, a skepticism that they just don't want to accept. And I'm just, I'm just reaching here, but hypnosis, this is, this could, this could actually help on an issue like this, couldn't it? Absolutely. I mean, quite often I'll get someone who'll say, but that won't work for me. I mean, I've seen what X, Y, and Z is doing or what's happening, but that won't work for me. And so I can work with them on. A, why it wouldn't work for them, and B, getting them to actually try it in the first place. And more often than not, they'll find that actually they do benefit from it because if they're following essentially the process and they're sticking to, to the rules that have been laid out for them or the, the knowledge that's there, then they do get the better results. PACER. I want to read this really quick because I really like this. It's an acronym that you have in your work. So the P is for positive. State what you want in the positive. A, the achievement how will you know you have achieved it? C, the context. When do you want it? E, the ecology. What will happen if you achieve it? If you achieve it, will you lose anything? And R, the resources. Can you initiate it, achieve it, and maintain it? These are things that we just generally, sometimes we kind of fly by the seat of our pants. And there's, if you define your goal setting and define where you want to go and that type of, uh, with that type of specificity, a lot better chance of getting to your, to your end uh, outcome, isn't there? <laughs> I think so. I mean, trading is essentially like being self-employed and you have to plan what you want and you have to make sure that it is realistic. So, you know, if you go in with, I don't know, £7,000 and expect it to turn into a million in a month, then you're, you're quite you're not going to achieve that it's very unlikely and therefore that's going to impact your self-esteem and your belief systems whereas if you have a look at i don't know the um, interest rates if you'd invested that in a, in a year's savings you might have got two percent on it whereas actually if you traded and traded reasonably you might have made ten percent which would be very good and then you can build up from there and so what the pacer does uh, it helps you to break it down and plan what it is that you want to achieve and how you're going to do it um, you have to constantly learn you have to constantly review what you're doing if you know that at the end of the year you'd like to be x amount richer but you don't know about how you're going to go and do it then how will you expect to achieve it as you were just outlining that i was thinking of an example uh kind of a tangential example i, I have a trader friend in london who's become one of the most successful 
traders in the world. He's, uh, he's made several billion dollars. His fund is probably north of 30 billion. For all of us, we can, and I, and I myself have done this, I can look up to him, I can, I can look at his, his writings, his, his words, and I can, I can learn so much. But I think sometimes people really need to also put into proper form of their own thinking where luck and expectation, because you really can't wake up and say, I expect to make billions of dollars in the course of my lifetime. There is a certain degree of luck with that. I mean, there's, we can all count it up. There's only so many billionaires in this world of 7.5 billion people. And I, so I'm curious, you probably see in your, your work people that their expectations don't account for luck. No, no, they don't. And sometimes you have to you have to build that in, and, and so they understand, you know, where these people have come from in the first place. Perhaps they've been born into families where they've been able to afford a very good education, or perhaps they've been employed uh, in very good companies that's given them the, the foundations of the training, or perhaps they've had family who had a lot of money and traded and lived in that sort of lifestyle. And also, you know, when you make billions, you have to accept that you're going to lose. You could lose billions as well. Uh, and that's where the, the problem comes in. You know, people can accept loss, but they can't necessarily ex- uh, accept the larger losses. And you have to work with them on that and being able to understand the, the full cycle and the full process, not just the small snippet they might be focusing on. And there could even be the person that starts with absolutely nothing. And this might be my friend's situation in London, that you could be in a situation where you start with nothing, you get to the billions. I think I just, I, when I listen to you talk, I think sometimes, uh, uh, not, not that you're saying this, but I, I think in my own mind, is that having an expectation that one is going to start their trading career and make billions of dollars might be the wrong goal, the wrong expectation, because... No matter what, regardless of how smart that trader might be, there's a certain amount of luck involved. And you can't beat yourself up over luck. If, if, you, if you think that you will make millions and that is what your, your end goal is to be a billionaire, in theory, there's no reason why you couldn't achieve that, but it's going to take a while to do so. And it takes a lot of hard work and dedication. And it's, do you have that within you as a person? Um, some people don't. And some people do. And, you know, can you accept that it's going to take time? It's not going to happen overnight. Working out the plan from there. So actually your first step is probably getting, you know, a nice pot of money in your savings and then, you know, being able to double that over a certain amount of time and then you've got to double that over a certain amount of time. And if each each year you're increasing your pot by 50%, then how many years is it going to take you to get into the billions? Well, we need to get this life extension stuff going on if we're all going to be billionaires. Uh, we need a little bit of time to get there. One last quick question. It's probably not quick, but perhaps you can give people, obviously, they can always reach out to you. But let's say people have liked this type of conversation. They want to explore more. So I want them to reach out. They want to you know, take a look at your book, Hypno Trading, A Practical Guide to Using Hypnosis and NLP to Improve Your Trading Performance. But... If people want to find a suitable hypnotherapist, where would they start? They can't all call you. I can't have thousands and thousands of people calling you. You've only got so much time of the day. What's the best place for people to start if they want to go down that path? Well, in the UK, there's the um, CNHC, the Complementary National Healthcare Council, that's got a list of approved hypnotherapists. Obviously, Google's a quick one, but you can't always guarantee who you're going to find. Is there any is there any pitfalls for looking for people? Are there are there are there things that you might if if one is looking for someone like red flags that you might say if you hear that av- avoid that? Is there any kind of that the advice you can offer? I mean, I would I would say as, as a trader, you want someone who can if they don't have experience of working with a trader, can at least pick up very quickly what you're talking about and they understand the wider uh, range of issues and they can demonstrate that with you. So a lot of therapists offer a a free consultation or a cheap consultation that's separate to a session. So you would go in at two different times. That gives them time to plan and think about what they're going to do with you. And and that's something that's always a good thing to look for. Um, if If you're sat there talking to them and you don't feel that, you they understand what you mean or where you're coming from then that's um something to avoid because with any kind of therapeutic setting you need to have a positive rapport for your therapist if you don't feel comfortable with them then you just won't work well with them so that's something to look for as well Um, and also make sure that whoever you go to has full insurance 
Good advice today. Interesting conversation. Catherine, where can people go to find more information on you? Hypnotrading.co.uk is the website. It's got lots of information on it. You can use the contact form to get in touch. I'm always happy to uh, chat to anyone, really. Thank you for taking the time today. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's been really good. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, Michael. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money and up down and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right Trend Following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.